panel discussion on the Cradle of Humankind and Michalisburg region. My name is Pippa, and I'm the publisher of the Straight Nature imprint at Penguin Random House. And I'd like to thank you all for attending what I know is going to be a fascinating discussion on a, a remarkable part of our country. The Cradle and Michalisburg region is a treasure trove. Um, we all know it for the fossil finds and paleontology, but it's so much more. It's one of the richest and most fascinating parts of South Africa, known for um, the archaeology, archae history, biodiversity, geology, landforms. There's so much more to it than just the fossils that have been found there. And we're going to hear about all of this today from our expert panel, each expert in different areas. So we'll get a, a good spread of, of um, background to the place. And they will give us insights into some of the, the wonders and the stories behind this three billion year, year old landscape. Chairing our discussion today is Vincent Carruthers, who for many barely needs um, introduction. He's, Vincent has written many books and several for Straight Nature, and most recent of which is the remarkable Cradle of Life book, which tells the story of the Michalisburg region and the cradle. And in that book, um, Vincent documents the emergence of life from the, from the very start of the Big Bang right through to the current day, such as on history, um, ecology, the biodiversity, geology. He, he, he follows a timeline from the very start of the planet to the current day, and it's packed with amazing information, and it's a, it's a wonderful story. And I'd encourage you to, to, to purchase the book. To let you know that at the end of the discussion, the, the title will be available. And there's a, there's a voucher code that um, will give you access to the book at a special price. Please wait until the end of the, the panel discussion because that will come up in the chat and you'll be able to get a direct link through to Loot and you'll get a voucher that you can um, use to purchase the book at a discounted price. I also need to let you know that this session will be recorded. So if you know anybody who wasn't able to attend it, it will be accessible via YouTube and we would encourage you to pass that on. Um, one other um, bit of information, uh, at the bottom of your screens, you'll see there's a Q&A. That, that panel will come up if you click on that, that button and we welcome you to post your questions. The panelists are looking forward to hearing from you and at the end of the discussion, we will be addressing some of those, well, as many of those questions as, as time allows. So please do write and um, anything that comes up as the discussion ensues, we, we would love to hear from you. I think that's enough from me. Um, Vincent is going to chair, as I say, chair the discussion and he'll be introducing our four expert panelists. So I would like to hand over to Vincent and ask you to sit back and enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pippa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen almost immediately because that will help. Um, and tell you that we're going to be traveling down an extraordinary passage of time over, as Pippa said, three billion years of history that is written into this landscape. And what makes the landscape so extraordinary is that it covers that enormous time span in, in a whole different uh, bunch of ways. The, the area that we're talking about lies between Pretoria on, on the east and Rustenburg on the west, about 100 kilometers wide and about 40 or 50 kilometers deep from Macholi City um, right through to Brits in the north. So it's that area that uh, I, I've circled with a, ri a ring around it. And um, the colored part of the map is the Macholisburg Biosphere Reserve, which has been registered with UNESCO and offers um, some degree, not only of protection, but of sustainable utilization of the area. Belinda Cooper will be telling us much more about what a, bio, uh, what, what a, a biosphere reserve really means when we, when we get there. Um, I mentioned that it is, uh, th this landscape is particularly interesting from a whole lot of different points of view. The paleontology is of course, the one that everybody knows best, particularly the paleoanthropology, which is the, the origins of, of 
hominins and human beings eventually. But there is also a rich archaeological history there, um, dating right through from the beginning of the earliest human beings and the very uh, primitive Stone Age uh, uh, hunter-gatherers society right through to modern times, um, the, the modern battles and the fortifications that are excavated by archaeologists there. Um, that includes and, and blends in with a rich, rich history, which um, is part of South Africa's um, sometimes very traumatic past, but, but always very, very interesting. And that is told in the landscape here too. The geology that underlies it, of course, um, is extraordinary from a number of points of view, but most particularly because on the northern fringes of the Michalisberg biosphere, that map I showed you, are the richest platinum fields in the world. The southern boundary is the richest gold fields in the world, and in between is the richest paleontological um, fields in the world, the fossil finds. So we have really three uh, um, supreme uh, super superlatives in the geology. And finally, there is the biodiversity, which uh, we're going to be hearing about in, in some detail because it too is exceptional. Now, each of those things uh, that I've put up on the screen would make this, this area exceptional in its own right, but altogether, all five of those things make it utterly unique. And that's what we're so excited about when we look at the, at the region. Um, when I tried to put all this together, I, I lent on the expertise of all sorts of people from astrophysicists, historians, geologists, and so on. And I tried to pull together the threads of their knowledge and their information and, and put them into a, a single volume. And that's the book that Pippa has been talking about. But today we have those experts with us, at least four of them, and we can rely on their expertise directly. And I'm hoping at the end of the session, you'll question them and, uh, and hear directly, as it were, from the, from the horse's mouth. The first uh, person I should introduce is Mandy Esterhazen. Professor Esterhazen is an archaeologist, <clears throat> but also um, profoundly well in informed in paleoanthropology, and she will be talking about that aspect. She heads the Origin Center. If any of you have not yet visited the Origin Center, it's, it's one of the most extraordinary exhibitions of early human beings and early occupants of this region, of the what we're now calling the Biosphere Reserve. Um, and she's also busy, I think, uh, revising the storyline at, at Marapeng. And so she's got a whole lot of hats to wear in, in that capacity. Belinda Cooper is the coordinator of the Michalisberg Biosphere Reserve. Um, I've, I've always called her the manager, but she says she's not the manager because there are other people doing all sorts of things in the biosphere. And she's, she's, she coordinates them. Um, her expertise lies in UNESCO's biosphere concept and the philosophy of a biosphere, as well as the actual projects, current and future, that are going on in that region. Um, I mentioned the rich history that there is in this part of the world, and Andre will be introducing us to one aspect of that. That it is the uh, he's the business manager at Kedar, and I said you should visit the Origin Center. You should also, if you're at all interested in the Anglo-Boer War, visit Kedar. I believe it is the richest. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andre, it's the richest uh, collection of South African war heritage material um, in private hands and maybe even including public hands, public museums and so on. It is a fabulous place to go and see um, what happened during the South African war. And so he'll be talking about that. And she's also, he is also writing a series on the people of the Michalisberg, which is being published on, online um, as we speak over the next few months. Tony De Castro is with us. He's a professional ecologist, <clears throat> and his speciality is grassland and savanna, um, which is which are the two biomes that are critically important to our region that we're talking about. He owns uh, an environmental consulting practice, and he runs what is known as the Sugarbush Ridge Voluntary Ranger. So he does a lot of of um, voluntary work as well as his professional uh, career. Those are the people that we're going to, to be talking to. And before I bring them on one by one to talk about their speciality, I want to quickly, as quickly as I can, because I don't want to use too much of their time, run you through the timeline of three, more than three billion years ago, when prior to that, the entire planet, when it cooled down to this magic temperature that we live in at the moment, where water is liquid more or less all of the time, 
um, there was no land whatsoever. But underneath the sea, on the seabed, tectonic plates were pushing and shoving each other around. And eventually, 3.1 billion years ago, one tectonic plate, this gray slab, thrust itself underneath another one, the yellowish colored tectonic plate, and pushed it above sea level. And it became the first dry land ever on the planet. And those of, who, <coughs> those of us who are in the cradle in the Hollisberg area are sitting slap in the middle of that very first continental piece. It was joined in over time by other cratons that emerged and were pushed up in similar fashion and became the great supercontinents. But uh, before that happened, in the shallow water that surrounded the Carpval Craton, one of the forms of bacteria, and bacteria was the only form of life that there was at that stage, one type of bacteria evolved the incredible ability to photosynthesize, to use sunlight to convert the, the minerals in, the, in, in water into carbohydrates that allowed it to grow vigorously, but it also discharged as a byproduct oxygen. And the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere and in, dissolved in the water changed the whole trajectory of evolutionary history. It accelerated history uh, and, and evolution dramatically and the bacteria evolved into higher and higher forms of life. I don't like that word higher. It suggests that we are perhaps better than bacteria. Um, and we might even think we're better than a virus until you remember what's going on around the world right now, where we're certainly not yet better than the virus. Anyway, oxygen was released and, and really made this, this part of the world, this Carpval Craton or the Hollisberg area, such an important um, place for, for, for environmental uh, evolution to take place. Another byproduct that happened at the same time was the, the production of calcium carbonate. It formed stromatolites and those stromatolites became or turned themselves chemically into dolomite. Dolomite rock is the amazing rock that uh, forms into uh, caverns under, underground. And it's where, of course, all the fossils are deposited over time. Before that happened, however, the whole landscape was smothered in sediments, quartzite and shale sediments drowned the, the dolomites and, the, and the, the cyanobacteria and grew and grew like a Dagwood sandwich, one layer upon, it, upon another, and then eventually um, dissolved away or were eroded away, leaving the landscape that we are familiar with today. And of course, in the shallower parts of that landscape, are the caves, the, the Stirkfontein and other caves where the fossils are assembled. And that is where our story with Mandy Esterhazen is going to begin. She's going to be talking about the paleoanthropology and, and life from that stage on, the evolution of human beings onwards through the um, archaeological history, right through the early Stone Ages into the the Iron Ages or the, the pastoral peoples who occupied this part of the world later and ending in the 19th century when there was enormous disruption in the Michalisberg region, in fact, uh, much of South Africa as well. But here that disruption was um, marked by a series of invasions by different people upon others and the conquest of the place by Zilikazi and then ultimately by the Boers and, and the settlements that, that are now established in the region and the wars that they fought. And that is where uh, Andre Widerpol is going to come in and discuss the South African war, some of which has left remnants on the landscape like this fort. The landscape itself, of course, was not only, it was not only a place for humans to develop, but thousands and thousands of other species were also evolving. And they have evolved into an exceptionally diverse biodiversity and where grassland meets the woodland, as you can see in this, this picture here, Tony De, uh, De Castro will be talking about that. So that we had this development of all species, the Homo sapiens and thousands of others. And that ended up with our developing ourselves as human beings more and more rapidly and more and more um, consumptively of the resources that they were. And that over consumption of our resources has led to UNESCO becoming concerned and developing things like biosphere reserves, uh, which Mandy, which uh, Belinda Cooper will be talking to us about, and trying to get human beings to 
integrate better with their natural environment and not to just damage it and, and exceed its capacity to, to renew natural resources. So that's the storyline. Um, when it's, it's going to make a very fascinating story, we're going to whiz back along that timeline now to the, to the cave age when hominins were beginning to form. And I'm going to hand over now to Mandy. Uh, Mandy, um, can you come in? Uh, Hi. Mandy, Good there afternoon. She. Can you hear me? Hello, Mandy. I'm going to just share my screen. Um, share. There. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to pick up more or less where Vincent already left off about why the cradle of humankind is, in fact, the cradle of humankind. Of course, this is a bit of a marketing ploy because, in fact, Africa is the cradle of humankind and we find fossils throughout uh, East and Middle Africa as well as in Southern Africa. But Southern Africa has a particularly rich deposit. And why is that the case? Well, Vincent's already given us the clue. Um, he's talked about the fact that there's dolomite. And of course, within the dolomite, there's calcium carbonate. And every time it rains or slightly acidic water, part of that calcium carbonate erodes out, either mechanically um, or physically. And of course, you get caverns forming underneath the ground. Now that lime that seeps out, you're all very familiar with, because often it forms stalactites and stalagmites. But what you may also be unaware of is that this also adds to the fossilization process in that this lime adds to the mineraliz mineralization of the bones. But why am I going on about the lime? Well, basically because what I'm touching on today is how the technologies that we use and technologies have come about have helped with our understanding of the past. And you will remember that gold was discovered in Johannesburg in the late 1800s. And of course, initially when they started mining it, it was the exposed outcrops. And that gold was easily removed um, because they could crush it and they could just basically extract it with an amalgam, uh, mercury amalgam. But as they got deeper, it became more and more difficult to extract the, uh, extract the gold. And of course, gold almost came to a standstill. The mining almost came to a standstill because they couldn't really extract it. And so what happened then was they developed a process called the MacArthur Forest Cyanidation Process. Now this process required lime in order to neutralize the acid uh, with an alkaline. And of course, what happened then is overnight, these dolomite caves with the limestone in, inside of them became mined. Miners moved in, they blasted open a lot of, or if not all of our sites that we know today in order to remove the lime because lime became a sought after commodity. And it was at this time then that the miners started exposing the fossiliferous deposits. So for the first time, we have this huge record of fossils coming to light um, as a result linked to the mining in Johannesburg. How did these bones get into the caves? Well, as the caverns form underground, eventually over time, these cracks and fissures in the dolomite open up to the surface of the earth. Now that means that bones and all sorts of stones and things that are lying on the surface of the earth can either wash in and or hominins or other animals that are on the surface of the earth can accidentally fall in. And I'm going to show you a little video here um, illustrating this process. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So that gives you an idea then of how some of our fossils have got into these caves. And of course, some of the most complete fossils are the ones that accidentally fell down in the cave and then died and decomposed within the cave itself. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these later on. But Raymond Dart then was alerted by the miners to one of these fossils. And of course, you all recognize immediately that he is holding the town child. Now he then, in this, in, this is in the early 1920s, then argued that this was possibly the missing link between ourselves and some kind of ancestral ape. But at the time, the rest of the world was absolutely unable to accept this. First of all, they felt that the human ancestor had to come from Europe or Asia. It would come out of Eurasia um, because at the time they felt that they were the most uh, evolved. And plus they thought that early evolution of our own species had occurred there and subsequently things had moved down into Africa. So in fact, our own record would be very, very recent. The other reason that people weren't happy to accept Dart's claim was that it was a child. Now, in apes, for example, like chimpanzees, the children actually change, particularly the heads. They develop more of a muzzle as they grow older. And so there was a good chance that, in fact, possibly this was an ape, but because it was a young one, that it hadn't fully developed yet. So what happened then was that there was a call. If you want to argue this point, you need to produce an adult. Robert Broom, who was a retired Scottish doctor, had taken up this as his goal in life towards the end of his life. And he effectively started working around Sturkfontein, Swartkrantz, and Cromdry, and he did begin to find adults. And of course, you'll be very familiar with his 1947 find of Mrs. Plez, Australopithecus africanus. And so it was around this sort of post-war period that people started to recognize that there was something else going on here. First of all, Africa, both in South Africa and in East Africa through the Leakeys, was starting to find an enormous number of hominin fossils. But also remember that during the war, there had been quite a bit of nuclear work. And it was around this time then that there was a realization that if you use the difference between stable and unstable isotopes, you can in fact date certain materials. And so the initial dating that was done on the East African volcanic materials actually produced incredibly old dates. And so the sites in Africa suddenly predated those in Europe and Asia by some, some, <laughs> some, some huge um, time periods. So for example, if we look at the earliest technologies which they claimed had evolved in Europe and Asia and come down into Africa, all of a sudden this was flipped upside down because the technologies that we have in Africa, and this is you looking at an early Achillean tool, which dates to about 1.7 million years in Africa, dates to about 500,000 in the site that it's called after of Saint Achoul in France. So thinking around these early hominins was suddenly turned completely on its head. Africa became the cradle of the earliest hominins. But also, that wasn't the only thing that the war produced. Dart coming out of the Second World War then decided that these early hominins that we, see, that we were seeing evolving in Africa were basically hunters. The war and all the atrocities that occurred during the war had developed this notion that, of course, humans are animals and we are vicious animals. We will kill one another. And Dart really built on this. He called it the blood bespattered archive of history. And for those of you who are familiar with Robert Audrey's work, uh, The Killer Ape and the African Genesis, that's where these ideas came from. So what Dart then was saying was that these little hominins that we're founding in Africa were in fact hunters. And they were the reason that we were finding all the other animal, homo, homin, uh, animal fossils within these caves um, as well as remains of themselves, because they simply killed each other. This man, Bob Brain, working at Swartkrantz at the time, effectively disproved him. He developed the, what we now call taphonomy, and it's a standard practice, where we actually study what happens to the animal from the point of death to the point of recovery. So the point at which the archeologist 
or the paleoanthropologist removes the bone, we look at everything that happens to that carcass to the point of recovery. And through this, he was able to show that in actual fact, these hominins were not hunters. They were simply the hunted. By studying all the marks on the bones, he was able to show that the majority of the fossils that had landed up in these particular sites, in fact, had been preyed on by either hyenas uh, or leopard, and subsequently either taken to their lairs, and then the bones had washed down into the caves. Now, as a result of that, a lot of what is removed from these caves are small pieces of and fragments of these early hominins. And of course, a huge range of animals that go along with it as well. And sometimes you're quite lucky, you get a decent looking fossil that comes out and you can kind of put it together. And this will tell you that you do have an upright hominin. But other times, this is kind of what you get, where it's all sorts of small fragments of bone that in order to actually make any sense of it, you have to have an enormous knowledge of anatomy. And if you do know what you're doing, in the past, you would be able to reconstruct it in this manner. But now here's where technology comes into play again. These days through digital imaging, uh, through CT scanning, micro CT scanning, which were largely developed for medical purposes, we are able to scan these particular bones and then we can 3D image them. And of course, because hominins and most animals are largely symmetrical, you can then project more or less what the digi digital side of the hominin would have looked like. And if you have enough of these small pieces of bone, you can pretty much recreate the entire skeleton. And this is Australopithecus sediba that was recovered by uh, Lee Berger. And you will notice the brown parts were the parts that they recovered and the white is that they have digitally projected. Now, what's quite interesting about this then is because technology has come such a long way and we have the ability to print in 3D, of course, we can print out an entire skeleton. Now, this is not only um, limited then to the actual fossilized bone, but also we have often preserved within the collection these endocasts or prints of the brains. This is the town child again, and you can see that it has a natural endocast. What has happened here is the child has died while it was lay laying on its side. Your brain is very soft. It goes away very quickly after you die. Lime filled with sand has washed into the skull, and before the skull has decomposed, it's taken a print of the inside of the skull. And on the inside of each of our skulls, we basically have the print of our brain. There you can see a colobus monkey, the same thing has happened um, naturally. However, nowadays, using a thing, synchrotron scanner, and of course using uh, various x-rays um, with uh, micro CT scanning, we can actually project the topography of the inside of the skull. And in doing so, create a 3D print of the brains. And this, of course, then allows us then to say quite a bit about the development of the brains and how, of course, they've changed over time. So here you have Littlefoot, and they have done a huge amount of research now on what Littlefoot's brain would have looked like. And of course, what they're able to show is that the parietal region um, indicates that, in fact, it's still more like apes, and it isn't as uh, more like ours which would indicate that it was able to use tools effectively, would have had uh, fairly good memory, uh, planning and forethought, which seems to come into being when you're looking at a homo sapien brain. You will also notice though, that they were also able to recreate the inner ear. And this then tells us a lot about how they were able to uh, move, locomotion, how they would have interacted with their environments over time. Now I'm skipping ahead because obviously with the changes in brains and the changes in body sizes, uh, as we evolve as homo sapiens, we become incredibly good at being able to make tools. And here you see tools that come into being at around between 500 and 300,000 uh, years ago, what we would call the middle stone age. And here 
these early Homo sapiens are starting to, in fact, ha uh, ha uh, put tools onto the ends of, um, of sticks and to be able to use them as spearheads. And they're also able to create symmetry. And so what we're seeing is an expression not only of, of skill in terms of tool making, but also symbolism, being able to plan ahead, being able to use tools to make tools. And of course, that's a very, very short skip to being able to use language and art and symbolism. So I'm jumping ahead quite considerably uh, for a couple of million years here. But I just want to point out that, as Vincent has already said, that the early hominins, in fact, roamed the Michalisberg. Um, don't be misled. Of course, they preserved in the Dolomites in the cradle. But in fact, they would have roamed the, the broken terrain of the Michalisberg, which was fairly broken and well watered. And we find that then people were attracted to that particular area. And here's some of the early engravings that were unfortunately moved, removed from the area and which we now have in the origin center. So if anybody would like to visit and see some of these, uh, they're welcome to come in and do so. But it gives us an idea of how the early hunter gatherers uh, roamed in this area through to the herders. And then at about 1,600, uh, years ago, we get the early farmers moving in as well. And again, they seem to be drawn to this well-watered, broken terrain, which would have given them a lot of the environment to be able to graze and hunt and use. And I'm just going to draw your attention, if I can, with my arrow to this little tiny patch here, just to give you my last and parting point in terms of this particular area, and it's important to the importance to the history of this country. If we look at the LIDAR image of that little strip, and this is just a, a portion of the strip, what we find here are an image of the earliest settlements um, that started building up in, a, in the 18th century. And this is from people moving in from what is now called Botswana, and of course, moving across from what we now know, what we call, the um, uh, Natal, uh, KwaZulu Natal, moving in and creating these urban centers. And so what we actually have in these, the early 19th, uh, 18th century, in the latter part of the 1700s, is the formation of urban centers in Gauteng. And this is Molokwani, it's one of the larger ones that we know of, but there are plenty others along that um, bottom end of the Michalisberg. And what it tells us is that we have very early urbanization prior to the arrival of colonials in this particular area. And the way in which we've discovered this and able to project this like this is through the use of LIDAR. Um, so basically it's a light detection system that we use. We fly a plane over that projects LIDAR pulses down and it records everything on the surface of the earth. They can then extract the trees for us. And of course, what we're left with is extensive walling. And what you're looking at here is the extensive walling of these early uh, urban settlements that, as I say, date to about the 1700s. Now, these settlements are disturbed and people abandon them when we go into the early uh, 19th century. And that was what uh, uh, Vincent was mentioning about the actual what we have come to know as the Difficani within this area. And at this point, I'm going to hand back to Vincent to pick up the story from there. Let me unmute myself and say thank you very much, Mandy, for that extraordinarily good insight into um, just a couple of million years of history, uh, all in, in 10 minutes. Thank you very much indeed. That was very skilled and, 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 and terribly important because this is the thing about which the Michalisberg or for which the Michalisberg is most famous, but it is also of relevance to human beings throughout the world. The, the, these, these are signs and, and this is evidence of our, of our extremely um, interesting origins. You, you ended your talk at the end of the, of the um, 18th century, going into the 19th century, which as I mentioned before, was a tumultuous stage. You, you mentioned the Difficani, um, 
which took place probably uh, over that, that change of centuries into the 19th century. It involved invasions, it involved um, people uh, migrating from one area into another, and it was very, very disruptive. And part of that was the um, arrival in this region of colonialism. I, I always regard that as just one of the many migrations that, that took place at that time of people who were leaving one region for political or military reasons and moving into another and displacing the, the original occupants in some cases. <clears throat> the, the settlement of colonial um, people in, in towns and cities in this area also brought with it what we now think of as modern warfare, the use of firearms, the use of stone fortifications and, uh, and cannons and, and that kind of thing. And at, by the end of the century, we had got very good at killing each other that way. I'm not so sure how wrong Dart was. You know, sometimes I look at these wars and think, gee, we, we are a very disruptive people. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Andre, who is a specialist in that, the, the, what was known as the Anglo-Boer War or the South African War, the biggest of all conflagra military conflagrations on the, the, the southern part of the continent and um, bring in Tony, uh, bring in Andre now to, to talk about that. And Andre, if I can, um, can you come in and, um, I've got Mandy on my Present screen. I'm, I'm here. You're here, yes, thank you very much, hello. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Andre. Um, at about this time, the, we're now talking about the very end of the 19th century, in fact, 1899, um, we had this enormous war and what was it that made the Mahalisburg such a particular, particularly important theater of war in, in that particular battle or, or warfare? Because of course it was fought across the country, um, but the Mahalisburg, um, in, in particularly in 1900 after the fall of Pretoria, it really became a center of, of, um, of importance during that period. Thanks Vincent, let me start um, by sharing my screen. Um, Okay, um, so what we see here is, is a view from the, the top of the Michalisburg near Skierpoort, um, looking down over this, this wonderful fertile valley, the Moort, uh, between the, the Michalisburg and the Bitbartersburg, which runs parallel to it and just south of that. And really there were four factors that, from, from a sort of general point of view, that made the Michalisburg uh, particularly important during the South African War. Um, the first was simply that the mountain range was a barrier to movement for both uh, Boer and British forces. And, and because of that, the, the passes over the Michalisburg became important points to defend. Uh, passes like Silkart's Neck and Commander Neck and Olifant's Neck. Um, the second uh, factor was, was the height of the Michalisburg, which uh, in some of the battles became tactically uh, very important. Uh, to, to be able to dominate the, the higher ground. And then thirdly, the Michalisburg with its uh, deep cliffs and rugged terrain was also a, a place to hide. Uh, and we must keep in mind that from about June 1900 on, onwards, the Boers were waging uh, guerrilla warfare against the, the much larger conventional army of the British. And in guerrilla warfare, one of the, the key factors for success is that the guerrilla force must be able to hide away and then emerge to strike uh, at the right time. And uh, the Michalisburg uh, with these deep cliffs and rugged terrain provided exactly that for the Boers. And then the last uh, factor generally, uh, which made the Michalisburg region so important was the, the fertile valleys at the foot of the Michalisburg and particularly on the Southern side, uh, this, um, this valley known as, as Dimwurt, um, and what the British realized is that uh, fighting this, this Boer guerrilla force, they had to make it impossible for the Boers to live off the land if, if they, Britain, were to win the war. And this, of course, is when the, uh, the terrible scorched earth policy of the British Army came in. And from about September 1900, they started systematically uh, destroying the crops, killing all the livestock, uh, destroying Boer farmhouses uh, in the Moort, and then ultimately forcibly removing the entire civilian population, both black and white uh, from, from the Mwert and, and other areas and, and uh, 
uh, interning them in concentration camps. And of course, thousands of people, most of them uh, women and children, died in those camps. And that has left uh, a legacy of bitterness, uh, which, which still uh, endures to this day. Andre, you, you mentioned that height, the altitude of the mountains, played a role in some of the battles. Uh, give us an example of that. Okay, a very good example of that is the, uh, the first battle of Silkart's Neck, uh, which was fought on the 11th of July, 1900. Uh, Silkart's Neck is just east of Hardebeerspoort. And uh, basically, what th this was one of these very important passes uh, over the mountain, away through the barrier. And uh, what happened here is that on the 10th of July, 1900, uh, Colonel Harry Roberts of the British Army had camped around that low kopi in the center of Silkart's Neck with a force of about 240 uh, British soldiers. Uh, but Colonel Roberts neglected to place any of his men up on top of the Michalisberg on either side of that low kopi. And of course, as you can see, uh, the kopi is completely dominated by the uh, the heights of the Michalisberg on both sides. Now, Boer General Kurs de Ray, of course, took full advantage of this weakness. And uh, General de la Ray, uh, his, he, he, he had excellent scouts. He knew everything that the British were up to. And when his scouts reported to him that this British force was camped there in the middle of Silkart's Neck, he devised a plan which involved the British being attacked simultaneously uh, by three groups of Boers, about 600 men in total. And two of those groups attacked from the heights of the Michalisberg uh, on both sides of Silkart's Neck. And uh, Colonel Roberts found that he was completely powerless to do anything about this hail of Boer rifle fire that was descending on his position. He had two 12-pounder guns with him. Uh, you see them there in the map just east of the copy. But the guns couldn't be elevated high enough to, to fire up onto the heights of the, of the Michalisberg. And so by dusk, uh, Colonel Roberts, having suffered heavy casualties, uh, realized that uh, there was nothing else that he can do and his entire force uh, surrendered to the Boers. So the height of the Michalisberg here played a very significant role in, in giving uh, the Boers a very comprehensive victory at the, the first battle of Silkart's Neck. Yeah, then uh, there was another general, the, the Free State General, um, Christian de Bet who also used the mountain, the, the height of the mountain, to manage to escape from being virtually surrounded by superior numbers of, of British, and also by doing so to let his president, President Stain, meet with President Kruger down in the Lowfelt. And between the two um, leaders, the two republics, they, they continued the war. But tell us that amazing story about General de Vette getting over the mountain. Yes, this was another one of these great contests that played out in the Michalisberg region, in this case between uh, General Christian de Vett and his uh, small group of Boers. And on the British side, uh, General Lord Horatio Herbert Kitchener, uh, who at this point was commanding more than 50,000 uh, British soldiers who were attempting uh, to capture de Vett and President Steyn. And in fact, uh, de Vett and Stein and the Boers with him had been pursued uh, all the way from the, the Brunfarter Basin in the, the Eastern Free State. And uh, by the 21st of, of August, 1900, uh, de Vett, uh, now with a group of about 250 Boers, seemed to have been cornered and trapped uh, just north of the Michalisberg at the farm Bockfontein. Uh, which is just west of Commander Neck. Uh, by this stage, President Stain had gone off with a bodyguard uh, eastwards to meet with, with Paul Kruger. But uh, de Vett and his men at this point really seemed to be in a very dire situation. There were uh, large numbers of British soldiers descending on them uh, from several different directions. Um, but General de Vett, with the, the assistance of an elderly black man by the name of Amos, uh, managed to find a cliff uh, leading up uh, the Michalisberg. And uh, this cliff was hidden from the view of the nearest group of British soldiers by a, a long, low copy, uh, which to this day uh, is still known as de Vette's scale copy. Uh, in other words, the hill uh, which, which hid de Vett. And there, there you can see uh, just south of Volitz's Kop was Brigadier General Charles Ridley with about 500 mounted infantry. Uh, 
just about four kilometers away from Debet, but because of the long low kopi and the kloof, and Debet and his men uh, were able to ascend the Mechalisberg, and it was only when they were right near the top of the mountain, uh, more or less at the point from where this photograph was taken, uh, that they became visible uh, to uh, General Ridley and his men. And here you can see uh, on the right is Debet's scale kopi uh, with the kloof in front of it, and there in the middle of the photograph in the distance is, is Wallace's Corp. So it was more or less at this point that um, Tibet and his men started heading for the top of the mountain and all the British soldiers saw were these boers rapidly uh, disappearing uh, with their horses uh, up to the top of the mountain and over it. And uh, somehow Tibet and his men with, with their horses managed to descend the very steep slopes in the Mechalisberg on the south and uh, headed back to the Free State and were able to continue uh, with guerrilla warfare uh, up until the end of the war. Yeah, you, you and I have, have scrambled down that almost precipitous space that um, De Vette climbed down with, with horses in, in, in tow, I mean, obviously not riding them, leading them, but um, it, it was a remarkable, a remarkable accomplishment. And then, um, Andre, if you could finish by telling us about the biggest of all of the battles in the Mahalisberg region, the Battle of Neutgedacht, um, where again, topography, the topography of the land was a very important component of the strategy or the tactics of the two armies concerned. Yes, and this again was, was one of these epic duels uh, between personalities on the British and Boer sides. In this case, on the British side, Major General Ralph Clements, uh, and on the Boer side, uh, again, General Quirst de la Rey. And uh, we're talking about the Battle of Neutgedacht, which was fought on the 13th of December, 1900. Uh, General de la Rey was assisted at that battle by General Bayers and General Smuts, but the, the, the strategy which was devised for attacking the, uh, the British was very much uh, the work of, of General de la Rey. Um, so on the 8th of December, 1900, um, General Clements camped uh, with a group of about one and a half thousand uh, British soldiers uh, just south of the Michalisburg at Neutgedacht. Uh, Clements uh, with his column had been moving up and down the Michalisburg for about three months, uh, implementing this, this terrible British scorched earth policy. But here he was now camped at Neutgedacht. Uh, he also had uh, nine artillery pieces with him in addition to the one and a half thousand soldiers. Um, and again, this is a case where the height of the Michalisberg was significant because from the, the top of the Michalisberg cliffs, um, Clements, his men more or less from that position, the top of those cliffs uh, just being lit by the sunlight in this photograph, um, Clements' men were able to communicate with other British forces in the area using an instrument called a heliograph, which basically uh, is a tripod with two mirrors mounted on it uh, that uses the light of the sun to send messages as, uh, as Morse code, flashes of light. Um, so from that point of view, Neutgedacht was a, a convenient place for Clements to camp. Um, he actually had two camps. There was a mounted infantry camp uh, directly below the sunlit cliffs. And then Clements' own camp was slightly to the east uh, of the, the Neutredach Gorge, again, directly below the mountain. Uh, but this height, which he found useful for sending signals, um, also made him terribly vulnerable uh, to attack uh, from on top of the Michalisberg. Uh, now, Clements thought that he had taken care of that because he posted uh, 300 men of the, the Northumberland Fusiliers on top of the Michalisberg on both sides of the, the Neutredach Gorge. Um, to, to prevent his, his camps and his force being attacked from the top of the Michalisberg. Uh, but Clements had not uh, reckoned with the military genius of General Coeur de la Rey, uh, who had devised a plan of attack uh, where the British were to be attacked simultaneously in seven different places. Uh, four of them up on top of the Michalisberg, uh, a thousand words in total there, and another one and a half thousand words down in the valley attacking in in three different places. And uh, in the very early hours of the morning on the 13th of December, the attack was launched. Uh, the British soldiers on top of the mountain were very quickly overwhelmed. And so by seven o'clock in the morning, uh, there were a thousand Boers lining uh, the cliffs of the Michalisberg and firing with their Mauser rifles uh, down onto the, 
uh, the British camps into the British camps uh, below the mountain. And uh, the situation, of course, for Clements was com completely untenable. Uh, so the, the, the height of the Michalisberg here, the, the, the topography at this point, uh, very much worked to the advantage of the Boers. Uh, but then there was an aspect of the Michalisberg uh, topography that now came to Clements' rescue. Uh, there was a low hill down in the valley um, on the left of this photograph, uh, known to the Boers as Falkor. Uh, now, this essentially um, geologically is, is a horizontal layer of, of an igneous rock called diabase. Uh, we call it a sill. It was probably formed about 2 billion years ago. Um, and uh, Falkorp is about three kilometers from the, the base of the Michalisberg. And uh, part of Clement's force were some volunteer soldiers. They were called Imperial Yeomanry. Uh, and they had been, some of them had been positioned on Falkorp and it became known to the British as Yeomanry Hill. And they had in fact managed to retain possession of Falkorp despite uh, General Jan Smuts trying very hard to, to drive them off. And it was that, uh, that low copy, that diabase sill in the valley, which now rescued Clements. Uh, he was able to extricate about the, the, the portion of his force which remained and move all of his, his remaining men and his nine cannons uh, up onto the summit of Falco. And then later in the afternoon, about four o'clock in the afternoon, he was able to withdraw uh, from Falco eastwards uh, to the British uh, military base at Rietfontein. Um, so Neutgedacht is a very good example of how at first uh, the Michalisberg topography worked against Clemens and uh, then in fact uh, this, this low copy in the valley actually worked uh, in his favor. So it was a very significant Boer victory uh, but uh, it was not a total victory and Clemens uh, thanks to some Michalisberg topography, managed to, to extricate himself from the situation. Andre, thank you very much indeed. That's a fabulous insight into this um, extraordinary war, which still, more than 100 years later, has military historians absorbed by the complexity of it and the, the use of the landscape. Um, all sorts of aspects of this war have made it interesting and, again, this landscape in the Hollisberg region is such an important aspect of it. And thanks for introducing us to, to that, um, Andre. Thanks very much indeed. If you can unview yourself, thank you. Then I'm going to ask um, Tony to come in because while all this was going on and, and after the end of the South African war, there was a, a rebuilding of South Africa. That scorched earth policy had to be, uh, it, it required the entire reconstruction of all of these places, the, the, the wide expanses of South Africa had been destroyed by the, by the British during the course of that war and they had to be rebuilt. And so there was an economic recovery of some, of some importance during the, the early 20th century. And that has grown consistently ever since so that human beings are now entered into the, this period that we refer to as the Anthropocene when no longer is the environment influencing our uh, our evolution, but we as humans are impacting on the natural resources of, of nature itself. And that in the Michalisberg is another example of why this landscape is so important because the biodiversity of the tens of thousands of other species besides Homo sapiens that have evolved there and are utilizing this very complex, rugged countryside and the habitats that it provides, this has given us an amazingly rich um, biodiversity. And I'm going to ask Tony to come in now and explain to us why the biodiversity of the Michalisberg region is so much richer than one might expect of, of just an ordinary landscape. Hi, Tony. Hi, Vincent. Thank you. I'm going to try and share the screen quickly. Right. Um, so basically what uh, Vincent alluded to is that um, for an area of this size, the Mechanisberg Cradle Biosphere um, has tremendous biodiversity. And uh, biodiversity is, is, is usually simply a reflection 
of the, the habitat diversity that occurs in a particular area. The habitat diversity, the climate of the area in turn influences the vegetation, which forms the basis of, of, of ecosystems. It's, it's, it's the factor that we use to describe ecosystems. So the ex exceptionally high biodiversity of the um, Cradle Michalisbeck biosphere is largely attribu uh, attributable to the fact um, that there are no less than three biomes and 13 vegeta vegetation types in what is a comparatively small area for such huge diversity. Um, the three biomes in the cr Cradle and Michalisberg biosphere are, are predominantly the savanna biome in the north, the grassland biome in the south, um, and then very small patches of uh, remnants or relic patches of Afro-Montane, uh, Afro-temperate forest, uh, which forms part of the forest biome. So three biomes, 13 uh, different uh, um, vegetation types. Um, in reality, there are, there are seldom distinct boundaries between vegetation types. Um, and vegetation types or ecosystems tend to grade into one another. Uh, these transitions uh, between vegetation types or ecosystems are also referred to as ecotones. Um, and these ecotones often have very high spe species uh, richness due to the fact that they contain elements, floristic and, and faunal elements or species from both of the uh, vegetation types that meet in that particular area. Um, in in certain, sp uh, certain species actually favor those transitional zones above the uniform areas of other habitats. Um, a conservation area should therefore ideally incorporate um, as much uh, um, habitat diversity and as many vegetation types as biomes as, uh, as possible. Um, and the Cradle Michalisberg biosphere is a textbook case of this. Um, it contains, um, as we said, three biomes and 13 vegetation types, which dramatically enhances not only the biodiversity levels, but it's also its conservation value. Um, according to the Gauteng Province's conservation plan, a very large part of the, uh, the biosphere is also uh, mapped as uh, critical biodiversity areas. Right, um, so we'll briefly give some examples of the, of, of the biodiversity, some of the more interesting examples of the biodiversity um, included within the area. Um, for that, that's just to show you the complexity of the 13 vegetation types that occur. Um, and remember that the, these vegetation types are shown as distinct units, but that doesn't occur in nature. So it's not only those 13, 13 vegetation types, but also the, the ecotones between each one of those vegetation types. And that's gives you an idea of just how complex this area is in terms of biodiversity and biology. Okay, uh, currently there are some, uh, this is just a, another view of the Michalisberg, the, the hills in the south, and Vincent showed some nice photos earlier. Um, on top is grasslands and uh, mostly grassland on very skeletal soils. And you've got typical sort of bush felts uh, on the slopes and you've also got Afro-Montane forests in some of the cliffs. These are the, uh, the south facing slopes of the Michalisberg. Okay, currently there are about 48 threatened and, or near threatened plant species in Gauteng. And no less than 12 of these occur in the, in the biosphere. That's about a quarter of all the threatened or near threatened plant species that occur uh, in Gauteng are found within the biosphere. One of these is the critically endangered Michalisberg aloe or aloe peglerae. Um, which is uh, restricted entirely to its distribution range, restricted entirely to the Michalisberg biosphere. It occurs on shallow quartzitic soils on the north facing uh, slopes and summits, uh, and it flowers in, in July and August, as you can see here. Um, in 2014, uh, field surveys indicated that the population uh, comprised some 70,000 individuals. Uh, but unfortunately, due to uh, collection in the wild in order to satisfy uh, markets created by, um, by the horticultural trade, um, today there are only about 20,000 plants left. Uh, this is despite the fact that most plants occur in formally protected areas or, or nature reserves. Um, <clears throat> the, the wild harvesting remains the most important impact to this critically endangered species. Now, the next species we'll briefly discuss is the Albertina sisulu orchid, or Brachycorythus conica, subspecies transvalensis. Um, it's a very fascinating species that um, was, uh, after being first discovered, uh, was then never, uh, never found again uh, after 1956. 
and it was only rediscovered in 2007 um, near the Walter Sassoula Botanical Garden on the southern boundary of the of the of the, the biosphere on the Rurikrans Ridge. Um, they are the um, due to uh, rapid urbanization, most of the original localities of the species have been lost. And today there are only four extant subpopulations or localities. Um, three of these contain only a handful of individuals and have already been earmarked for development. The, uh, the Rillicrons population on the edge of the biosphere uh, contains some 90% of all the remaining orchids. There's only 150 individuals left and about 135 of those occur occur on the Rudikrantz Ridge. Um, uh, it's despite the, the, the fact that, um, that there are only 135 individuals in the sub subpopulation, the, the plants are, uh, it's a very healthy subpopulation and the plants are uh, so great, the subpopulation shows great genetic diversity as you can see from the, the, the next few photographs. Um, each flower, it's sometimes difficult to believe that they're all the same species. Uh, each flower has not only unique markings, but coloration on, uh, on the lip of the flower. It's uh, basically a, a fingerprint. It's as distinctive as a human fingerprint, the, the coloration and markings on, on, on the flowers. It's, as you can see, dramatically different, and they have in the past led to taxonomic confusion where they were actually classified separately, but these are all individuals of the same population at the same site. Okay, and then one of the most iconic birds of the, the biosphere is the Vero, Veros or Black Eagle. Um, these uh, magnificent birds have wingspans of over two meters and are known to live for over 45 years in the wild, although this is exceptional. Uh, according to the Vonneboom Black Eagle project, there are currently eight breeding pairs in the Machalisberg and an additional pair um, occurs in, in Rudikrantz in the Walter Susulu uh, National Botanical Garden. And these are possibly the most famous uh, eagles in the world. They have nested on the, on the cliffs next to the waterfall in the Botanical Garden for the past 80 years. Um, in the Michalisberg uh, and throughout most of the uh, distribution range of the eagles, their primary prey is, is dassies. Um, the, the pair in the, in the Walter Susulu Garden are unique in that their prey consists primarily of, um, of scrub hare and guinea fowl, which shows how highly intelligent and adaptable these birds are. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, this, uh, two eggs, uh, these birds lay two eggs in, in April or May, and the edge, uh, eggs hatch 45, 44 to 45 days, with the second leg be, uh, egg being laid some um, four days after the, after the first. Um, and invariably, the first chick then kills the second chick in something that we call the, uh, the Cain and Abel syndrome. Uh, fledging, fledging or leaving the nest occurs from 90 to 99 days after hatching. And then the chick spends roughly two and a half to three months learning how to hunt and being fed by, by, uh, by the parents um, until one of the, for the, uh, the pair, invariably the father, gets uh, a little bit irritated. And um, as is typical of most teenagers, he has to be uh, forcibly evicted from the house. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, one of the males in, um, at Walter Susulu, uh, busy with a creation display towards the youngster. And it takes a few months of this before the youngster gets the message and he eventually leaves the territory. Um, this guy is looking extremely alert and concerned. This is a scrub here, because uh, within the, the biosphere, these are probably the the equivalent of the of the bulltong bulltong buck or hamburger of the biosphere. It's not just the black eagles, but practically every medium or large predator within the biosphere is after this guy, and uh, they have to be on high alert twenty seven. It's a common scrub air. Let me move on to um, another bird that is uh, extremely uh, important within the biosphere, and the, the biosphere plays a crucial role in its conservation which is a Cape vulture. These huge birds of prey um, have a wingspan of over two and a half meters and weigh some seven and a half kilograms. Uh, they're also known to travel as far as 750 kilometers from their nesting site um, uh, when, when they are not breeding uh, in search of food. And two breeding colonies remain in the Machalisberg, uh, one in uh, near Skeerpoort, another one in Nooit Gedacht. Um, 
thanks to the extremely successful conservation e uh, efforts being conducted by organizations such as Volpro, uh, both colonies have doubled in size since 2005, and today there are approximately 400 breeding pairs in the Mahalisberg, which is a huge conservation success story. Uh, conservation measures have uh, revolved mainly around educating local farmers and communities on the dangers of using uh, uh, pesticides, poisons to control problems, uh, jackal such as uh, problem animals such as jackal, and also the establishment of numerous uh, vulture feeding stations. And as a result of these efforts, uh, most local farmers and communities uh, now not only tolerate the uh, the vultures but recognise them as a as a valuable uh, asset and tourist attraction. Um, the apex predator of the of the biosphere is, is the leopard. Um, the uh, this big cat uh, this big cat is is currently categorised as uh, as vulnerable um, throughout its distribution range, which extends all the way from India to South Africa, um, and this is primarily due to to habitat loss, poaching, and persecution. Uh, in, re in recent years, extensive and ongoing uh, uh, research has been carried out on leopards uh, of the Mohalisberg by John Power from Northwest uh, Conservation. And this has revealed a lot about these highly elusive animals that were extremely poor, poorly known in the Mohalisberg until recently. Camera chap records indicate that between five and 10 leopards um, are currently resident in the Mohalisberg, uh, and a few more occur in the cradle. Uh, and these leopards uh, occasionally even visit the Walter Sisulu uh, National Botanical Garden, although this is a very rare occurrence. Genetically, the Mahalisberg leopards uh, are savanna leopards, which are far larger than the Cape Mountain leopards, some twice the size. Uh, the males trapped by John in the Mahalisberg uh, for the purposes of research uh, weighed between 60 and 70 kilos. So they were very large, powerful animals. Um, in the Bukhalisberg, their, their territories are normally centered around game farms where there's uh, an abundance of prey of large ungulate or buck prey. Um, and their territories are, are for both females and, and males are about 30 to 40,000 hectares, which is unusual for leopards because leopard males normally have far larger territories than, than the females. <clears throat> in the Bukhalisberg, their, their major prey is, uh, consists of, uh, the prey consists mostly of daco, bushbuck, uh, baboon, Jamison's red rock rabbits, um, though any species of ungulate or buck is taken if the opportunity presents itself. In the case of larger species such as kudu and hartebeest, the leopards usually confine themselves to, to sub-adults and juveniles. This is one of the, uh, the uh, leopards, uh, the individual called Brandy, that uh, female that was rescued by uh, John Powell and his team and uh, treated, was caught in a snare and then released back into, into the Mahalisberg. You can see the, the collar, it's one of the leopards that has been used in, in their studies. Okay, then we move on to a far lesser well-known uh, spe uh, threatened species that occurs within the protected, uh, within the, the biosphere. And the biosphere forms a, um, is, a very, is very important to the conservation of the species. These two are females. It's uh, the mountain reedbuck, which is currently was recently upgraded and is now currently regarded as an endangered species. Um, it's a medium-sized buck. The males weigh, weigh up to about 35 kilograms and are slightly larger than the females. These are both females that you see here. Um, this is a male. With, uh, one of the cameras in the Walter Sisulu Botanical Garden. They're very fond of taking uh, selfies of, uh, of themselves. They can uh, hear the cameras incredibly acute uh, sense of hearing. So they hear the cameras triggering and they go up and take some selfies. The, uh, they have highly complex, these uh, buck have highly complex uh, social structures. Um, and they, the societies include territorial males, non-territorial males, bachelor groups, uh, and unstable herds of, of, um, of females and young. Uh, the females, very interestingly and uniquely, the females leave uh, the herd to give birth in isolation and the new lamb, uh, newborn lamb weighs only three kilograms. The lamb then, uh, then remains hidden in the grass or between boulders for the first two to three months. Um, and the female visits the lamb briefly and only once or twice a day for usually for not lo longer than half an hour. Um, before the, the, the ewe then leaves the lamb, it actually consumes the lamb's feces and urine in order to take away 
uh, any scent of the mountain reedbuck from the lamb's hiding place. And once the mother leaves, the, the lamb then moves on to a nearby uh, hiding place. So they change that every single day. Um, this unique behavior is an adaptation to the rugged terrain preferred by these uh, mountain reedbuck, which is normally very uh, rocky north facing slopes, um, which make it impossible for the young lamb to keep up with the herd uh, when they are moving uh, quickly or evading predators. Uh, mountain reedbucks are, are highly elusive animals. Um, and the first sign of their presence is usually their characteristic alarm call, uh, which is which most people mistake for, uh, for a bird call. Um, and once, once they whistle, they immediately depart the area. And that's normally when you see them moving off at, at, at high speed. Here is some uh, rare footage from the, uh, again, from the Riddicranch Ridge showing a, uh, a young uh, mountain reedbuck ram, about a year old, who's uh, practicing territorial marking and, uh, and is then disturbed and, and runs off whistling. Yeah, lastly, the last example that uh, we'll give of the rich biodiversity is a, um, is a, a critically uh, endangered species, which is the Juliana's golden mole. Uh, there are three subpopulations known uh, of this species, one in the Kruger Park, one in Nilesflow, and one in the biosphere, the, the uh, southern foot slopes of the, um, of the Bronberg in, in sandy soils in, in um, Berke Africana woodland. Um, the, the species are critically endangered, specifically in the Braunberg, due to habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Much of the southern foot slopes of the Braunberg has been used for, for sand mining in the past and consists of small holdings. And this fragmentation isolates the individuals and, and causes genetic erosion in, in, within the subpopulation. It's um, the, uh, one of the, the, uh, the main reasons for, uh, for the conservation of the Braunberg and why so much emphasis is placed on the, um, the conduction of thorough ecological studies for the purposes of EIAs in the, in the Braunberg is because of this little guy. He's only about 10 centimeters long and weighs some, uh, some 22 grams. And uh, his, his main diet is crickets and, and, uh, and, and earthworms and so on. And interestingly, if you walk in that area, I mean, your chances of seeing these guys are extremely small. They spend 90% of their, of their time underground or more. Um, but you can often, if you know what you look for, you can actually see their tunnels in the, in the sand where the, the tunnels uh, break the surface. And you can actually put your finger in and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and see the directions of the tunnels. But that's not always advised because uh, this is one of their main predators and uh, you might encounter one of these guys with your fingers. It's uh, the mole snake. You can see their sharp sharp heads they adapted to to predation of underground uh, mammals such as the the golden moles and the and mole rats yeah that's it vincent uh, back to you thank you very much you. tony uh, for giving us um, that uh, summary of, of the of the wealth of, of biodiversity that we have we're running a lot over our time a lot of time and i'm encouraged to see that nobody has left the group yet so i'm, I'm hoping that you have all been thinking what I've been thinking, and that is that I didn't want to interrupt the speakers in each case uh, because they were so, so interesting in telling us some really interesting stuff. But um, I'd like to just point out that we've reached the stage now where we've, in, in these talks, where you've got the rich biodiversity that Tony has described and the rich history and development, and nowadays the prosperity and overpopulation of the one species, Homo sapiens, and that leads inevitably to some kind of a conflict. So um, I see you've got some other nice pictures, Tony, but I'm going to ask you. No, to no, sorry, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get out of here. My apologies. Okay. Uh... No problem. No problem. I'm going to go to, to Belinda, who um, is going to talk to us about the, the Michalisberg biosphere, because around about the, the, the late 1940s, UNESCO recognized the need to address this problem of overutilization of natural resources. And they created the notion of a biosphere reserve, which is what has been um, 
um, attributed now, or, or the, the Michalisberg has been given that status internationally because of its, its value and its ability to fulfill the needs of the biosphere <laughs> reserve. So Belinda, do come in. Um, I'm sorry, and I, I apologize to other people, but I think you're gonna find Belinda's talk very, very interesting indeed. Um, and Belinda's going to be quite quick, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be very quick. I'm gonna race through it, Vincent. Um, thank yeah. you for having me, and thank you so for- You've got some important things to say, thank you. Thank you for having us today. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Um, there we go. Right, so, um, so Vincent, we're gonna talk about conservation and development in the Anthropocene. So we're looking at an era where nature doesn't dominate anymore. It's now a human dominated world. We've got over 7 billion people in the world and um, they're causing massive changes to our environment and our natural world. Those, state, those changes include the sixth mass extinction that they talk about now and um, things like climate change. So in the Mahalis Bayer, um, as Tony was talking about the interface of the grasslands and the savannah, we're looking at the interface of rural and urban life. We're also looking at the interface of the first and the third world. And at this point, a lot of um, challenges uh, occur. Those that come from the first world with overconsumption, um, the throwaway societies we live in, we've got eco-developments and tourist establishments that want to build their places higher and better and closer to the natural environment, which is causing fragmentation and um, erosion of pristine habitats. And then on the other hand, we've got third world characteristics such as dire poverty, um, and uh, a lot of um, migration of job seekers looking for work in the urban areas. They're also looking for um, work in the mining, which in mining, which happens a lot on the northern um, areas of the Michalisburg biosphere. And these people are living in ridiculously unserviced informal settlements. But we don't only have that problem. Even formal settlements in our country are, are, are not managed properly in terms of infrastructure and services. So these all put in a massive challenge on our biosphere. But, um, uh, you know, UNESCO um, were perfect in um, responding to these challenges by developing the Man and Biosphere Program. So if you want me to continue, I will. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you, uh, what are some of the projects that are carrying on, uh, being carried on in the biosphere? No, I do, we do want you to carry on, please, please. Okay, so I just wanted to say that uh, the Man and Biosphere Program is now 50 years old. Its anniversary is next year. So they have been working with, at the moment, there's 714 biospheres across the world in first and third world countries. And what they look at is they look at the incredible natural and um, cultural diversity and uh, natural and cultural assets that the biospheres have and that are recognized internationally. And um, these assets are, need to be protected and conserved and treasured by the people that live in a biosphere, as well as the people that visit a biosphere. So the MAP program tries to integrate man and the biosphere by making um, the, the, the human aspect um, sustainable. In other words, you don't keep people out of a biosphere, you integrate people and the work and the activities that people do within a biosphere, but in a sustainable way. So if you have a look at the slide, there are you know many ways that, um, uh, that UNESCO is trying to, um, to address the conflict of man and, and his environment. Thanks, Belinda. And, and your own biosphere project, what, what, are, what are some of those that you are coordinating? Okay. Um, well, so, so at this, in this time of COVID, um, you know, we've had a, a huge massive retraction of funding, especially for conservation organizations. But we've been very lucky in the Michalisberg biosphere as we've been, um, we've received funding from the German Commission for UNESCO and from the German Federal Foreign Office to implement a program to, um, to, to, to stop the environmental degradation that is happening due to COVID-19. So what we're seeing is we're seeing that because of the economic collapse, a lot of people are turning to natural resources, either for to sustain themselves or to make money. So because of the commercialization of things like um, wood harvesting and poaching, indiscriminate poaching of species for protein, 
um, uh, the resources of the Michalisburg are under threat. So what we've put together is we're just really extending a project that was already happening. Um, you know, there were, there's a lot of work being done around poaching and snare patrols. And so our project has been able to assist um, these other organizations and NPOs in their work in, in doing snare patrols in the Michalisburg. And we've ramped up the patrols. Um, we're patrolling at least once, twice a week um, in all areas of the Michalisburg at the moment. In addition to that, um, the, the Save Our Species project is, has also rolled out an app. So it's an app with a portal where we are able to survey and monitor and record the problems that are happening, happening in the biosphere, as well as the um, biodiversity features that we find in the biosphere. So, so, so this information is going to become an, an enormous data repository, which will be able to be used by the people of the biosphere, by other organizations, and by research in the biosphere. The third component of the Save Our Species project is our lovely SOS Eco Ranger program, where we've taken um, seven guys from the community, from different parts of the biosphere, and we're training them um, to become biosphere ambassadors. Um, conservation managers for our environment. So they do a number of things. Um, uh, you know, we, we've trained them theoretically with um, a number of experts who've trained them, and they're also having practical training in the field, and they are now confident men who are eager and keen to do work in the biosphere um, going forward. Uh, but I just wanted to mention, um, uh, Vincent, that we are not, you know, the biosphere itself the NPC, are not the only people doing projects. There are many other organizations that do projects, and we like to support these organizations. The one, um, Western Northern Areas, together with Allo Farm and Flora RSA, are looking at restocking the biosphere, well, the Michalisburg Range, the Vidvartisburg, with Allo Peglare. So they've already planted 100 plants in safe places that they can monitor. Um, and also they are rearing, they, they're applying for permits so that they can collect seeds sustainably so that they can revegetate other areas of the Michalisburg and the Witwatersburg that are all but denuded of this um, incredible species. Then on the other hand, we have an amazing project that's being done by the Rhodes University Center for Biological Control and the Harties Foundation um, who is supporting them in the Michalisburg biosphere. And they are rearing um, something called a um, megalomus, megamelis, sorry, <laughs> scatillaris. I'm very sorry, but that is a hyacinth um, uh, um, uh, plant hopper, which is a biological control. Now, biological control is obviously what we want to use in water bodies because it's completely eco-friendly and not harmful to any other species. So they're rearing the, these, um, these um, little insects. Um, in the Heart of Beersport area, and we're hoping to have a PhD student doing some work on it um, in, in years to come. Not only that... Oh, sorry, about, sorry. sorry, no, I, I uh, carry on because you want to talk about the research. Yeah, I just want to mention that we, we also like to support research because research is one of the basis of, of, of practical implementation in the biosphere. We, 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 we try and implement practical strategies through, through sound research. So this is something that's being done currently um, by the WITS um, Department of Animals, Plant and Environmental Studies, and they're looking at eco the eco-hydrology and water quality um, through the Gwede catchment. The Gwede catchment is the source of the headwaters of the Stagström and the Maraltwani River, which are some of the most pristine the pristine water that comes out of the Michalisburg. And as you can see from this slide, what, you, what you're looking at is water quality. And you can see as we go through the biosphere um, from the pristine mountaintops where water is really, really clear through the transition zone, after a few mining activities, there's a spike. Um, and then once you've left um, the biosphere downstream of mining and the wastewater treatment works, there's an incredible spike in the, um, in the um, sorry, this is, they, they measure, they're measuring um, electrical conductivity of the water here, which gives you an indication of the pollutants in the water. And then um, downstream of the wastewater treat treatment works, um, the, the water quality gets, is, is, is really bad. So this is gonna give us an indication of what land uses are affecting our water. 
um, besides obviously plastic pollution, which is something that many other NPOs in and outside of the biosphere are dealing with. Um, and then I'd like to just mention some other published research that's come out this year, which lends itself to what Tony was talking about, the black eagles. These are the black eagles' nests that they found in the, in the Michalisberg um, that they've been monitoring for some time. And they're looking at interesting things like um, what, what, what prey is being eaten in a peri-urban environment compared to what the um, urban uh, rural black eagle pairs are eating. And also how there is competition for ledge space between black eagles and baboons. Um, so this is current published research 2020. And then I just wanted to move on to um, something else, Vincent, uh, which is what we do in the future and how we and where we go from here. And I just wanted to show you this slide because it's an overview of the green economic activity in South Africa. There's so much being so much investment in energy, transport, agriculture, and there's so little in conservation. Look how little is in water. Look how, how little green investment is in waste. So I think in the future, these are the areas where we need to build investment and um, create, uh, you know, and, and, and apply for job creation. And I think it needs to be a public and private partnership. We can't rely on government to do all of this, and we can't also rely on NPOs. We need, um, corporates and in the international community to come to the party and support um, conservation endeavors and endeavors in restoring our natural habitats. And if we do that, we'll be able to um, uphold and maintain some of the sustainable development goals that biosphere reserves lend themselves to achieving. Um, I'd also just like to, to, to finish off by saying that um, it's, it's very important for the people of the biosphere and the people around the biosphere to, to respect and be proud of the heritage, the natural and cultural heritage. This is the way that it's going to be saved for the future. It's, it's not going to be saved by, um, you know, tourists will provide some money, but it's the people who live here that need to go there and experience the, the, the area and, 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 and learn to love the area and get involved. And there's so much happening with, um, uh, uh, you know, with SMSs and apps and all these things where you can pinpoint plants and trees and animals and you can learn so much from each other on WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups for culture and for natural biodiversity that it's, it, it, it engenders a sense of pride. And I think it's the sense of pride that makes it sustainable into the future. And um, my last slide for the day is um, our mountain is our future. And this was coined by one of the eco rangers from Majakaneng, and I think it really does say it all. Thanks, Vincent. I'm done. <laughs> We've lost you, Vincent. Hi, yeah, everyone. Um, We've lost I, Vincent. I have to come in here. Yeah, Vincent's computer has crashed. So I'm going to step in at this point and um, thank you all very much. It's been a really fascinating talk. In fact, there, we seem to have Vincent back. We're going to be moving into a question and answer session. Um, and I've got there, there are a number of questions that have come through. Whether we'll get to all of them is yet to be seen. But maybe. Vincent looks like he's still, he's there, but he's still battling. Can Are you, you hear me? Now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. All right, I'm back. I'm back with you all. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Computers do this to me. But uh, thank you, Pippa, for holding the fort while I was away. And of course, I don't know exactly where you are. I, has, um, has Belinda talked to you about the biosphere? Is that, yes. and are you going to question? Are you? Yeah, we can move on to questions. Yes, um, they, they're quite a few, so I can I can let you know what's come through, and and you can um, decide. I think who's who best should answer it. Some of them will be very obvious. Yeah. Um, okay. One of the first questions we've got is why is the top of the Michalisberg more or less the same altitude all the way across from Pretoria to Rustenburg? There don't seem to be any peaks towering above the rest of the range. 
Um, yeah, I, I think I can possibly answer that um, because it's a very fascinating reason why it, it is that way. I mentioned right at the very beginning that um, the, the Carpal Craton was created by tectonic plate movements lifting a piece of continental shelf up above. Oh dear, I think we've lost Vincent again. We have lost Vincent. Okay, okay, let me move on to another question and, and the, the relevant pa panelist will know whether it's aimed at, at him or her. So there's a question how, this is probably from Mandy, um, how has the study of human origins changed over the past 30 years? Hi, I'm afraid I've also had a bit of a crash, but I think you can hear me, I'm hoping you can. We can hear you. Great, thank you. So in the last 30 years, I think that the biggest changes that have happened have been in dating techniques. Uh, even 30, 20 years ago, uh, we were sort of reliant on East Africa to get our dates. So we would do a relative dating thing. But since then, um, dating has come a long, long way. And we have methods now that we can actually date the dust around the finds. We can date the um, calcium carbonate itself. Uh, we do electron spin resonance or paleomag, um, paleomag dating, which is based on the, the north orientation um, of the North Pole. And so effectively, we've got a huge number of ways that we can, in fact, get more or less direct dates on our fossils, bearing in mind that we cannot actually date the bone or the fossil material itself. So it's quite interesting then, that's one of the things that has changed is our dating ability. The other thing, of course, is that we can now, to a point, do DNA. And of course, DNA can track back and we can now see how things become recombined over time. So at what point did the early ancestors split, say, or our, uh, the common ancestor between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens split? We now kind of know those dates. Uh, did they re-interact again? Did they recombine? Yes, we know that Europeans have a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA. So I think the DNA has come a long way as well, uh, which has also changed the way that we've looked at things. And of course, one of the major changes is that we no longer see a direct line or a missing link, but in fact, it's kind of very fluid. Uh, it's like a meandering stream that splits and comes back together again. Um, and it's a lot more complex, of course, the evolution of our own uh, hominins and humans than we ever thought before. I hope that helps in a way. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. I, I've now moved next door to another computer, which might work better than my own. Um, and thanks very much, Mandy, for I heard the tail end of that excellent explanation of the, of the dating. Can I go back to that question of the altitude very quickly before I disappear or something happens? Um, tectonic plate movement shifts continents gradually around the planet. And the piece of continental shelf that we're sitting on, the old Carpal Craton, was once pushed right down to the South Pole. So the Michalisberg was actually at the South Pole and therefore covered by a sheet of ice. And that ice scraped off the top of the mountain. And that is why the altitude is universal all the way along its length. It's actually been planed off by an ice cap um, about 300 million years ago. When it re-emerged uh, back uh, out from under the ice, the mountains were all the same height. And then the valleys began to be eroded even more deeply because they are um, made of a, of a shale substance that is softer than the quartzite of the mountain. So we get mountains sticking up and the valleys uh, eroded away. So that answers that question. Okay, great. Thank you, Vincent. Um, we have another question from Rose. This is quite a long question. How do we preserve habitat loss legally and formally? That is, make the authorities put the sensitive environment first when considering development applications. And then she says that the Lanceria master plan is fortunately using the Cradle and Crocodile River Reserve as a boundary to avoid urban creep north, but impact will be felt by the environment and fauna. Probably, Blinda, you're the best one to answer that, I think, are you? Okay, I'll try. It's always a challenge. 
um, to deal with these issues. But um, in terms of the biosphere reserve, only the Western Cape biosphere has got its own dedicated legislation. The biospheres in the other provinces, and there are 10 of them in South Africa, we rely on current NEMA, National Environmental Management Act legislation, as well as the other National Environmental um, Management um, Acts, such as your air, con air quality control, your, act, your mining act, your um, uh, waste management act, and also the Biodiversity Act and the Forest Act. So in these acts, um, there are regulations which, um, which, which are supposed to monitor the activities that do take place. When you've got a formally protected area, which is what the core areas in the Mahalisburg biosphere are, they are formally protected by legislation, and those areas are supposed to have regulations. And regulations are practical implementations of environmental controls. Um, then you have the buffer zone of the biosphere, which is where the Crocodile River Reserve is. And there it's more interesting because you're looking at agreements, agreements between authorities and um, landowners to conserve and, um, you know, biodiversity stewardship, um, conservancies, private nature reserves, um, all in an attempt to um, conserve and minimize the impact on the environment. In terms of manning and patrolling, what, what you have is you have environmental management inspectors, you get them at national level, provincial level, and municipal level, and they work with the police and are supposed to look at any environmental transgression that the public um, brings to their attention. It's, it's challenging, to be frank, but it does work in, in some circumstances. Thanks. Thanks very much, Belinda. While you're on, there's another question that says, are there any projects where volunteers are needed? Yes. Um, uh, there are always volunteers needed. Um, we've got the Citizen Ranger program at the moment where volunteers are being used for snare patrols and mountain patrols, also to educate the public. Um, we have volunteers in communities who are, are, are desperate to educate the youth on environmental concerns. So um, Valpro, um, Valpro has, has got a scarcity of volunteers at the moment because their volunteers normally come from overseas. So local volunteers can, and can volunteer at Valpro and at many of the other organizations. I'm sure um, uh, the, uh, the organizations that are dealing with the pollution in the rivers that flow into the Hardebeersport Dam, the Crocodile River, um, the Henox River, the Yuxke River, there's a lot of work being done through collaboration, through ARMA, the Action for Responsible Management of Our Rivers. They are collaborating with the, the Henox Revival, um, Fresh NGO, and the Sugarbush Ridges Coalition, who are all doing um, sterling work in, 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 in monitoring uh, the water resources and the pollution in those rivers. All of those organizations um, uh, use volunteers, and, and whether it's time um, or expertise. Volunteers are yeah. most welcome to contact the biosphere. Um, and, you know, we can put them in touch with the various organizations that would utilize them. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, I think, for Andre, um, asking where specifically one might go and see some of the battlefields um, and what you can expect to see once you get there. Thanks, Pippa. Yeah, one of the, one of the, uh, the best ones to visit, of course, is the, the Neutgerak battlefield. Um, and a, a very big chunk of that is is at Ascari Game Lodge, um, uh, just in the in the Hickport region. Um, it's always uh, strongly advised to to go with someone who really knows and understands the battle. Um, and uh, top on my list to recommend would be Rob Milne. Uh, Rob is the the first tour guide in the world who has uh, specifically been qualified for Mahalisburg battlefields. Um, you can find him online, uh, or you can just Google Michalisburg Battlefield Tours and, and you'll find him there. In terms of what you can actually expect to see, uh, obviously the topography is, is, is very important, particularly for something like the Battle of Neutgeduct, um, and that's where you need someone with you who really understands the battle and how it played out. Um, but one of the nice things about the Neutgeduct Battlefield is there are still some of the British, fort British fortifications uh, that were actually built particularly uh, on top of the mountain. 
uh, and you can, in fact, um, uh, through a Skari Gan Lodge, actually drive up uh, in one of their vehicles to the top of the mountain and see some of those, those fortifications. Um, there are obviously different levels at which you can explore these battlefields. Uh, the easiest is just to, to drive past and have a look uh, and see everything from afar. Um, the second level would be to, to drive onto the battlefield at a place like, uh, like a Skari Game Lodge. But then if you are, are really energetic and you really want to get the full experience, you can, can hike the battlefields. Um, we, through the Johannesburg Hiking Club, we've been doing what we call heritage hikes, uh, two or three battlefields hikes a year. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, by all means, contact the, the Johannesburg Hiking Club and be asked to, to place it on their heritage hike mailing list. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I seem to be back again, Pippa, but um, okay. I'm, uh, I don't know how long it'll last, but I'm here. Okay, <laughs> okay, we haven't got that many that many more. There's another one for Tony about um, where one can go and see some of the spectacular plants and animals. What are the best areas, I suppose, to to go and visit to see some of these endangered um, species? So perhaps Tony could tackle that. Yeah, we've practically yeah, there's um, uh, yeah, but there are quite a few areas. But one must realize with much of the wildlife in the in the Michalisberg is that you have to put in a bit of effort and spend some time. It's not like the Kruger Park where you're going to drive around and see hordes of game everywhere. Having said that, there are some incredible places with uh, wildlife on display. Probably the the, the easiest place to, to get a real feel for the for the biosphere is the Walter Sassoula Botanical Garden, where you can see the eagles and be up close to their nest and so on. And then in the, in the Michalisberg itself, uh, there are numerous private uh, nature reserves. Um, there's also a very well-known mountain sanctuary park where you can hike. Um, you can also hike from their conservation area into adjacent mountain club uh, uh, cliffs if you get a, the, the requisite per permit for that. Um, and then you, that opens up the, the whole of the Mahalisberg for you. There are numerous cliffs which are quite spectacular. Once you're in them, you, you, you actually can't believe that you're that close to Johannesburg and Pretoria. And, um, and throughout the cradle is the same story. You've got so many uh, different private nature reserves that, um, you know, those are the places I would say at first is Mountain Sanctuary and the Botanical Garden. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. I see that there, um, a lot of the questions or few of them have been answered on the site. So um, if, if we need to wrap up, we can do so, okay. Vincent. Um, All right. Um, let's, am I still there? <laughs> yeah, you're still on. Um, the host is disabled. Uh, it said that the host is, I wanted to share a screen with you, which would be the sort of final slide of telling people how they can get the book and how they can get that their discount. Um, I haven't got that slide. Maybe Belinda van der Merwe from the background can put it up on the screen. I don't know if she's capable of doing that. My computer doesn't seem to want to. But um, I would just like to thank you, Pippa, and uh, Penguin Random House, Straight Nature, um, for doing this webinar for us, for putting us all on. Um, it, it's been a wonderful thing. It's, it's fabulous that, uh, that as the publisher, you, you are so so, so interested in our affairs and um, keeping us in, in front of the public eye. Thank you so I think I think we've I think we've lost Vincent again, but I know he wanted to thank all the panelists. The, the slide is up so people can see um, how they can get access to the book and they'll be able to get 70 rand off. Um, and just remember to use the VARC code CRADLE. Uh, are you back, Vincent? I, I think I might be. Can you hear me? Okay, you are. Oh, you are. This is yeah. such a pain, it's this technology. Fine. Anyway, no. um, I, do, I, I did want to thank the panelists, all four of them. It's been fabulous to have that level of expertise with us and for our, uh, the, the people who have joined, the participants themselves. I want to thank them, first of all, for participating, um, but also it's been, I think nice for them to be able to talk directly to people of the caliber of um, Professor Esther Hazen and, and Tony and Andre and Belinda, because uh, we've really been able to have the best people um, on, on the screen with us uh, to join in. So thank you all. I apologize for my coming and going inadvertently, but uh, I, I think it's been fun. I hope that 
everybody has enjoyed it as much as, as we have. Um, it is an absolutely unbelievable region of South Africa. And if we manage to convey that uh, message to people, I, I think we, we can be very happy about it. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks to you, Vincent, for a wonderful book. I can really highly recommend it. It's had wonderful reviews and it's, it's probably the best account that, um, we've, that I've ever seen on, on the cradle of, of um, life, as you call it. So thanks so much. And it's been a fascinating talk. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.